Diane with Allied Health Career Training, and now we are on Unit 20 with the MedAid uh, course in Kansas. And I want to talk a little bit about skin integumentary. This is actually a body system and the largest body organ. And uh, the correct name is integumentary, but of course we do call it our skin. This is skin, hair, and nails. So. I uh, just want to talk just a little bit about how the skin, what's going on in here. So down in here in your subcutaneous, you can see how you have this blood flow, right, along the bottom part here. And this feeds the skin. This, these ridges here that you see are collagen, and they attach one layer to the next. They hook this layer to this layer back and forth and it keeps things intact. Now holding all of this up are little fat molecules like this. They keep it all suspended. Okay, do you see how that is? All right, and then of course your top layer is just dead skin. And you can see your hair follicles here, your sebaceous glands, and they go from here where they're fed up, right? So what happens as we age is you lose these. You lose your adipose, adipose fat. You lose your adipose tissue here. It migrates up into the middle, yay. And so if you look at my hands and you look at somebody's hands that are 10 years, 20, you got like six, hands all 10 years apart. You could really see the difference. The younger you are, the more bounce you have here. You have more adipose tissue, cush, okay? And as we get older, as this leaves, this falls, you lose these ridges because you don't have these to keep it. See, so it collapses. You see how that might happen? Have you ever noticed the lower legs of an older person? Not a lot of hair growing there, is there? When these collapse, they lose their sebaceous glands, sweat glands, oil glands, hair follicles. They lose a lot of that because this collapses down. Yeah, can you see how that might cause a problem? I can think of a few. How well, without being able to sweat, do you think they're able to withstand heat? Not so much, right? Plus, they don't have this layer here to help keep them warm and to help regulate temperature as well. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but let's talk about shearing. Now, there's friction and there's shearing. Friction is putting pressure on it. Shearing is this action. Okay, so if you have someone who's sitting up in bed like this, and they're sliding down, the skeleton is pulling down, but the skin is stuck to the sheet. And so what's happening is these layers of skin are going like this. See, it's shearing. And so it kind of tears these layers. And so if you see an injury where it's elongated down the back or by their coccyx, that that's, tells me it's shearing, okay? And of course, you'd wanna put up a knee gadget just a little bit or maybe a pillow there in the knee maybe do some different things that might assist you with that so they're not sliding down. Problem, they slide down. What do we do? Pull them up. They slide down, we pull them up. Injury, injury, injury. Of course, when you pull them up, you always want to put their knees up and then use it, right? The transfer, the pull, draw sheet, whatever you wanna call it. One, two, three, up, over. So one, two, three, like this to pull them up so they are not getting drug up that bed, okay? That's protecting from shearing. All right, so that's what's going on with those. And of course, now I need to talk about pressure ulcers. 
decubiti. Um, when we're talking about pressure ulcers, as you know, the first sign is red skin. You're all CNAs in order to take this course, so you know all these. This is a throwback for you. A red area, especially over a bony prominence that doesn't go away after a few minutes, needs to be considered as perhaps a stage one pressure ulcer. Stage two is a blister or when that first very top layer is gone. Stage three is now when you're starting to come down, you know, and you can see that granulation tissue. It's not just that very superficial top layer anymore. And then stage four, you're all the way down into this. Okay, and then there's the unstageable because it's covered by slough, that yellow stuff that you can't get out or some eschar, which is that dark brown, and now you're unstageable. Okay. But if you can see part of it and it goes all the way down, then the entire thing is considered to be the, the, the highest level, like a stage four, right? Um, also consider that in some parts of the body, behind the ears, that's one that gets missed all the time. You know, if you've got hearing aids, glasses, and oxygen, that's a lot of stuff going behind the ears, putting pressure there. And can you see how thin, there's not much fat behind there or anything. So it can go from a stage one to a stage four very quickly without much depth change. But in other areas of the body, like the ischial tuberosity, your sitting bones, there, for some of us, there can be quite a bit of space there that can go from a stage one all the way to a stage four, okay? Now you never back, so you don't go, it was a stage four, but now it's a stage two. We don't do that. I realize that most of this is taken care of by the nurses. I know that. But some of you, it is, it is not against Kansas regulations for a med aid to do a dressing change unless they're packing it unless it's tunneling, unless it is um, a sterile dressing change. Most are not, so therefore you, by the state of Kansas, could do it. But remember, it depends on your policy and procedures of where you work. Some of you may work in a, a nursing home or especially in assisted living where you're the one that needs to do this. And so therefore, you need to be aware of these things. Not only that, but it's covered in your curriculum and there will be some questions on your test. So with that in mind, let's go through unit 20. So on page 140 in your text, you will notice that um, in the middle, it talks about major functions of the skin, temperature regulation, sensory stimuli. So as all this comes down, we talked about how that might affect temperature regulation, and in fact, sensory stimuli. As well as if they have diabetes and they have neuropathy, neuro, nerve, pathy, death, nerve death, that they're not going to feel things as well either. Also, it produces vitamin D. You need the sun for that, for the most part. And so, uh, but it's up to our skin to do that. Um, of course, and then body image. Now, Let's go down to the bottom of 140 in page 141. Dermatitis, itis. Remember itis? Itis means, I-T-I-S, talks about inflammation or infection of. So derma, skin, itis, so inflammation of the skin. So when you're talking about contact dermatitis, that's something that you've been in contact with that you're either allergic to or sensitive to. What do we do? We usually put a Benadryl cream or corticosteroid cream on it, something like that. Best to figure out what it is and to continue to look for what that is rather than just treat the symptoms. Of course, we do need to treat the symptoms at some point, but always be on the lookout and try and figure out what's different. Laundry detergent, um, soap, that kind of thing. Okay. Moving down, you can see psoriasis on page 141. Psoriasis is actually an autoimmune disease. Yeah, it is. So your immune system is hot and bothered and it's attacking the skin. What's going on is too many immune, uh, immature cells are moving up towards the top. 
So what your skin does is, as the cells die, it pushes it to the top and they slough off, right? That's why you exfoliate. So what's going on is it's coming up too much and it causes a plaque. Those are the silvery, um, almost gray, white, flaky stuff that you'll see on people's skin with red underneath it. That is psoriasis. Not only that, but psoriasis can also affect um, joints and um, other parts of your body. Um, psoriatic arthritis, you might have heard of that. And lots of times folks will take um, either a topical and if it gets bad and they have the insurance or coverage for it, they may take a biologic for this, uh, like your Humira, Tecfidera, that kind of thing. Okay. <clears throat> Now, um, burns, I wanna just quickly address those. As you know, there's degrees in burns, first degree, second degree, third degree. First degree is just red. It doesn't blister up. If it blisters up, it's a stage two or a second degree burn. Okay, second degree burn and then third degree. Now, second degree goes down and they can be very painful because they go down to the nerve endings. Third degree burns all the way down through it and actually the actual third degree burns are not painful. The second degree burns surrounding those are awful. Now, as they heal, they have a lot of scar tissue with it. Scar tissue is different than regular tissue. Whether it be a, um, a uh, pressure ulcer or a burn or what, any kind of scar tissue is not as healthy and strong as your regular tissue. And it will break down, it'll open up, it'll have problems much easier and faster than tissue that has not been um, harmed. If you will go to page 142, almost in the middle, where it talks about parasites, the book doesn't say it, but I have heard that it's on the state exam, so I just want to pass it on to you. I don't know the wording or anything like that, but I want you to be aware that the drug Quell is perhaps on the, at least on one of the three variations of the state exam. And just know that it treats um, scabies and lice. So you're well of that. So you're aware of that. Um, moving on further down, um, I would like you to know that there is a question also regarding um, infections um, in the skin and that you would need to know um, the different signs and symptoms of a skin infection. And of course, you're talking about hot, red, inflamed. Um, it might have some purulent drainage, which is pus, that type of thing. And then on the bottom of 142 and top of 143, it talks about a couple different dressings that you need to be aware of that there will be a question regarding. One is a wet dressing, and then another is an occlusive dressing, occlusive dressing. So a wet dressing can be used to soften skin and increase absorption of the medication. An occlusive dressing does not permit air to enter the dressing and is used to aid in absorption. Plastic wrap and petroleum jelly are examples. I rarely see this used anymore. Nonetheless, it's still in the curriculum, so we have to learn it. So learn those two and the difference between them because there may be a question and then it has both of those as options for your answers. And you'll need to know the difference to know which one to answer. Okay. Now, the last thing I want to cover with you in this unit is another a question that I've heard is on the state exam. I don't know how it's worded. I don't, it's, it's illegal for me to see the state exam. Teaching this as long as I've taught it, I have some ideas. I actually took it about 30 some years ago. So yeah, I have a little bit of knowledge, I guess. So, um, there's a question that has to do with a debreeding agent. Debreeding. 
Here we're talking about removing some of the dead skin out of the wound, okay? So the one that they want you to know is elase. The way I remember this is elase, erase. You're erasing the debris. Here we're talking about slough and eschar, the yuck in the wound that you got to get out to debreed it to get a clean wound bed. Is um, these are debreeding agents. Elase is the one they want you to know. I don't think they make it anymore. What everybody uses now is Santal. However, this is what's going to be on your test, from what I understand, at least on one of them, somehow. So be aware of Elase as being a debreeding agent. The other one they really want you to know is Regranex. Um, and Regranex is actually not a debreeding agent. You have to debreed the, the wound in order for it to work. But what it does is it stimulates the cells to grow. Okay, so that would be Regranix, and it's very important to follow the manufacturer's um, directions on that. You put it on for 12 hours, take it off for 12 hours, there's specific things to know about it. You also have to keep it at a specific temperature range, or if you don't, it is no longer effective. So those kind of things are very important to know. Not only that, but it's extremely expensive. and. Um, you know, gosh, if somebody paid $300 for a tube of medicine and you didn't put it in the refrigerator or something and it went bad, that that would be very unfortunate. So um, be aware of those things so that you can be an excellent medic. And that's the end of this unit.